Want to have a lot of fun, get fit, and help support a really meaningful cause this April? Join the 30-day Take On Addiction Fundraising Challenge. Just sign up to walk, run, cycle, or choose your own activity to raise money for Smart Recovery, a global leader in mutual support services that empowers people everywhere to take back control of their lives and gain total freedom from their addictions. Sign up is quick and easy. Create your monthly fundraising challenge, invite your friends, form teams, share your results, celebrate your accomplishments, and get in the best shape of your life, knowing you're helping Smart Recovery smash the stigma of addiction and heal individuals and their communities everywhere. What are you waiting for? Just go to takeonaddiction.org and start helping people everywhere lead life beyond addiction today. Welcome everyone. My name's uh, Dr. Katie Wickwitz. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of New Mexico. And on behalf of the SMART Global Research Advisory Committee, I'm very pleased to chair the first annual SMART Recovery Research Webinar Series. And this webinar features members of the SMART Global Research Advisory Committee, providing an overview of SMART Recovery research to date, updates on the latest research, and to explore the future research on SMART Recovery. So very thrilled to have all of you joining and, and our, our speakers today. And we will start with Dr. Allison Beck, who's a clinical psychologist and trial coordinator in the School of Psychology at the University of Wollongong in Australia. She's joining us very early, Australia time. So thank you, Allison. She's actually joining us from the future, uh, which, is, which is kind of fun. Uh, so brilliant work by, by Dr. Beck. Uh, she will provide an overview and update of evidence for smart recovery. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Wonderful, okay, I'm hoping that that's working. So thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for everyone who's attended today. Um, so this morning I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we did um, a few years back now around the evidence for smart recovery um, and also our um, upcoming update to that. So when we did this work, it was funded by the NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use. So we need to acknowledge um, very important um, our funder, our partner in smart recovery and also the rest of the research team because um, these projects are never done in isolation. Um, so just to begin with, um, many of you are probably aware that mutual support is something that is incredibly important when it comes to people's experience of recovery. And I guess by recovery, I mean whatever that means to the individual. Um, so being able to have that opportunity to have that social, that emotional, that informational support um, with other people who are going through similar things to you, it's really vital. Um, so much so that it's something that's recommended by um, clinical guidelines. And 12-step um, approaches, so yeah, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and so forth, they're the, the types of mutual support. It's an organisation that's been around for an incredibly long time, perhaps one of the most well-known approaches. Um, but I guess when it comes to um, 
treatment and support for anything. There's definitely no one size fits all. And for whatever reason, there's going to be some people who don't necessarily fit with a, a 12 step approach. Um, and so it's really important to have alternatives that are available so that people can find the support that fits best for them. So that tailored service provision is something that's incredibly important. And so we have smart recovery, which is another type of um, mutual support. It's something that um, is informed by motivational interviewing and cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, it's led by a trained facilitator and it gives people that option to be able to work with others um, on helping them to, to change their behaviour. And so from the feedback that we receive from people who go to these groups, we know that it's something that's important and that's beneficial. But in terms of the actual hard evidence, back when we did our original review, um, at that point in time, no one had yet kind of pulled it together to get a bit of a sense of what the evidence was telling us, sort of hard data or facts. Because I guess when you're talking to healthcare professionals and saying, hey, are you willing to refer into this mutual support program? Oftentimes what people were coming up against was, well, what's the evidence for it? And so when we did this systematic review, which I'll talk through in a moment, that was one step in that direction of being able to provide people with the evidence um, for smart recovery. Um, so we were particularly interested in understanding is smart recovery something that promotes change in the severity of addictive behaviours and the consequences? Is it something that people find to be useful? Um, is there particular things that might make it more or less likely that people are going to find it to be useful? So is outcome influenced by things like how well people engage in the group or how often they attend or is there other variables out there that, that might influence it? Um, and what's the evidence for feasibility? So these were the three questions that we had um, going into the, the systematic review. So when I say systematic review, um, basically what we wanted to do is take a look at everything that was out there, irrespective of whether it had been published or not, um, take a really comprehensive look at the literature to see what had been investigated, what the studies were saying, and what we could take from it in terms of our understanding of um, the evidence for smart recovery. So we, this is the first time that it had been done, so we're really broad in our inclusion criteria. We're happy for any kind of sort of design, um, didn't matter whether smart recovery was being, what smart recovery was being compared to or who was attending, what was being measured, just so long as it told us something about people and how they engaged in the groups and what the outcomes were. So we started off with 972 studies from our very broad search and filtered it down and eventually came up with 12 studies that, or 12 papers um, that told us something about how smart recovery works. Within those 12, um, many of them were survey-based uh, research, so um, trying to get a bit of an idea around sort of descriptive type stuff. Um, and then we also had four studies who did make a comparison to give us more definitive evidence around um, the, the impact that smart recovery was having. So in those four studies, we had one that was a randomised controlled trial. So you may be aware that that's the sort of, I guess, gold standard when it comes to being able to um, draw conclusions around how effective an intervention is. Um, so in that randomised control trial, um, they had a web-based program that was based on smart recovery called um, Overcoming Addictions. And they put some people into um, that treatment arm. They compared it against some people who were only going to smart recovery and then um, one treatment arm where they had people going to both. Um, so they had those three arms and looking at the, the outcomes by comparing those. Um, and one thing that was quite interesting about that study is that unfortunately they needed to abandon the arm where people were only going to the um, overcoming addictions program because it meant that they weren't able to also go to smart recovery. Um, so I guess that that's that kind of anecdotal thing that people wanted to have the option or the opportunity to be able to attend the groups. Um, so that was one of the studies. One of the other comparisons um, was based around a um, partial inpatient, outpatient um, hospitalisation setting. That was done particularly, um, it was a focused on patients with experience of concurrent mental health related conditions and addictive behaviours. And that one was a comparison um, between a smart recovery informed program plus smart recovery groups and a 12 step inform informed program um, plus the 12 step groups. Um, and then we also had a study that looked at um, within a correctional setting. And so they compared people who went through a correctional setting without doing any types of smart recovery groups um, against people who had done smart recovery groups 
or Smart Recovery Plus, um, what was a Smart Recovery informed um, program um, specific for, for people in correctional facilities. Um, So in terms of our findings, we had, um, and I should say that the, the four studies, the mental health one was split across um, two papers. So that's why we had four, but I've only talked to, to three types of um, uh, studies. So the Overcoming Addictions um, uh, program that was conducted in a community-based setting, um, and they did find that there was a significant reduction in alcohol, both in terms of um, the number of days abstinent as well as drinks per day and the, the consequences associated with alcohol use. So um, the, some of the treatment arms didn't differ, but what we're seeing is that smart recovery in and of itself can promote those um, changes. And then in the setting where we've got the, um, the co-occurring mental health and um, addictive behaviours, that one was a little bit more trickier to kind of tease out because the, the impact depended on the outcome that people were looking at. And so um, we had the AA-based group, um, that arm, uh, that they had a better uh, change in alcohol or likelihood of abstinence, um, whereas on the flip side in the smart recovery arm, we were seeing a, a stronger effect for things like um, uh, functioning, hospitalisation, quality of life. Um, but again, we're seeing that we've got some improvements um, across different types of, of mutual support. And then in our correctional setting, um, the odds of reoffending were significantly reduced. And when you had people who participated in the, um, the smart recovery groups on top of the ones that were informed by smart recovery, um, they're getting smart plus the smart recovery, um, that almost sort of amplified the effect. Um, so what we're seeing from this really early evidence is that it's supporting what we're hearing from participants is that, you know, people are finding these groups to be useful to sort of make some of these really meaningful changes. Um, when it came to our questions around treatment engagement and other types of process measures, um, the thing that came out most strongly was around um, attendance. So um, more sessions, more likely to, to get an effect was what was coming out in those um, early preliminary studies. Um, and then we've also got other things around, um, for example, group cohesion. Um, there was a study that uh, Pete Kelly and his team did um, where people who were in groups where they rated the quality of facilitation more strongly um, also experienced stronger group cohesion, which then seemed to have a knock-on effect in terms of their likelihood of using um, cognitive behaviour therapy skills, sort of taking those away from the groups and then using them. So there's some nice kind of interactions that could potentially be happening in the groups. Uh, and then in terms of feasibility, um, a lot of the evidence was speaking more towards um, attendance, um, likelihood of attending sessions, duration and involvement, those kind of things. So there wasn't too much out there at that point in time in terms of feasibility, a little bit of qualitative stuff, um, and at that point in time, um, no cost-related things. So it's a little bit of a snapshot around some of the things that we, we learned around what it was saying, the effectiveness of smart recovery. Um, but we also had a lot of really other important uh, take-home messages that at that point in time, the research was um, mostly around alcohol. Um, so even though there's a range of other addictive behaviours out there, a lot of the research did focus on alcohol. Um, and in particular, things like um, opiates, for example, sort of non-prescription use of medications um, and also smoking, there wasn't anything um, out there at that point in time. The other thing that was really, really tricky was that it's hard to compare studies because there's lots of big differences in the way that um, outcomes are measured um, and the way that, I guess, success is defined. So some studies might um, focus on the behaviour and well, actually a lot of the studies focused on the behaviour and there wasn't a lot out there around um, other types of, of outcomes. So although change in the behaviour in and of itself, obviously incredibly important, um, things like you know, quality of life, for example, didn't come up too often. Um, and one of the other things that we noticed wasn't um, there very much was around mental health. So with the exception of that, um, that body of work that was done in the um, co-occurring mental health um, system, there wasn't a lot of information out there around how smart recovery performs for people who also have co-occurring mental health conditions. And as we know, oftentimes these things go hand in hand. So there was this really neat opportunity to be able to think about these things and how they could potentially um, inform the future. 
And so um, we did this work back in 2015, 2016. Um, and when we did our searches back then, we left it open. So we went from beginning of time um, up until uh, 2016. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we had um, 12 studies that we included. And when we've just recently run some preliminary searches, um, just from 2016 to now, we're already see seeing around 17 or so that are likely to be added, added into the mix. Um, so we've got additional evidence from that RCT that I spoke of. Um, they've published some longer term outcomes because I should mention that those original outcomes were just for, I shouldn't say just, were three month follow up. So they provided um, important information for a shorter period of time. And now we've got evidence for a longer period of time. Um, there's studies out there now that are looking at smart recovery versus other mutual support groups. So in our original review, oftentimes smart recovery was um, compared to 12 step approaches. Um, whereas now we're seeing some comparisons emerge with other types of approaches as well. Um, we've got some more evidence that's coming up around the characteristics of people who attend, their likelihood of engaging and how these sorts of things might interact with the outcome. Um, we've got some tailoring that's happening for specific populations. Um, so Elizabeth Dale, a researcher through University of Wollongong, has done some wonderful stuff around um, cultural sensitivity and the appropriateness of smart recovery for Indigenous populations. Um, we've done some work around um, smart recovery for methamphetamine. And then we've also got um, smart track. So our team worked on being able to develop an app to be able to collect routine outcome monitoring data. So this was in follow-up to the systematic review. We wanted some way of being able to collect information from smart recovery participants in a sort of standard way to make it a bit easier to compare. Um, and then there's a bunch of other citations where smart recovery is becoming increasingly cited as part of clinical guidelines. Um, there's other um, types, it's being included in other types of reviews as well. So it's a really exciting time to be involved um, in this research and we'll be working on it throughout the year. So hopefully we'll have an update, um, a, a further update um, on the, the evidence and what it's saying about smart recovery towards the end of the year, perhaps early next year. So definitely watch this space. Um, and in summary, um, what we saw from that um, original review is that we do have preliminary evidence. It is in the direction of supporting what we hear from participants in that people do find it to be useful for changing their um, behaviours. And that more recently, we've seen an increase in the number of studies. Um, so there's more momentum when it comes to the research. And we're definitely getting a greater diversity in the research questions and the outcome assessments that are actually being used. So um, yeah, really looking forward to working on that um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, and for anyone who might be interested in a little bit more detail around the studies that um, I summarised earlier, uh, you can go back to the original uh, systematic review and all of the studies are cited there. There's a bit more information in that review um, if you'd like. And um, yeah, any other questions, feel free to type them into the, the Q&A and we can go through them. But yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Thank you so much, Ali, for that beautiful overview of, of this work. It's really exciting. We did have one comment in the chat, which, which is somewhat of a question maybe, that the Audi prison study involved inmates with a history of any kind of addiction and that results did not vary among them. Is, 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 do you want to comment on that? or? Um, I'm not sure if we're speaking to the same research. The one that I was speaking about was a study by Blatch that was done in Australia um, and that there was um, some analyses that they did run where the addition of the smart recovery groups um, made a stronger effect as far as I'm as far as I'm aware. Um, but I think I suspect we might be speaking wrong about the wrong study, but uh, not the wrong study, about a different study. But if that's not the case, please type back in. Great, and and it might be Aussie Aussie prison study. I'm thinking so maybe maybe the same one. Uh, another okay. question is, is: Has a study been done with veterans and smart? Um, at the point in time of doing the original review, no. Um, I think that there may be some evidence in the most recent batch, um, but I do need to go through that in a little bit more detail. But yeah, it's definitely a neglected and important area. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. And, and just a reminder for those of you who have joined to use the Q&A with, with questions uh, throughout. Uh, we, will, we will take them at the end and we'll also invite all of our panelists to be together at the end. 
to to go through broader discussion and questions. Uh, our our next speaker is is Dr. John Kelly, who is professor of psychiatry and addiction medicine at Harvard Medical School and founder and director of the Recovery Research Institute. Dr. Kelly will be speaking to us today about who uses smart recovery, preliminary findings from a U.S. longitudinal investigation of recovery and health. Uh, Dr. Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Katie. I like it when you call me Dr. Kelly. Um, <laughs> um, it's, uh, no, it's great to see you. And uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks, Allison, for that great overview. Um, thank you for joining uh, out of your busy schedule. We know you're all busy, but thank you for tuning in. Um, and uh, my job today is uh, I, I'm going to give you uh, some initial findings on a study we're very excited about, which is a large prospective study where we're following up people who are starting a new recovery attempt from an alcohol use disorder um, who affiliate with different uh, mutual help organizations or none, actually, as I'll show you, including smart recovery. So we can kind of look at in a real world comparative effectiveness, if you will, or comparative engagement uh, and selection into these different uh, groups, including smart recovery. Um, so as Allison uh, already kind of stated, and it set me up nicely, is, you know, we know these disorders are high volume, high burden disorders uh, that contribute a, a large burden of disease in the population of most middle and high income countries. We're talking about alcohol and other drug use disorders. And they often require often some kind of professional treatment for the more severe cases, as well as in those more severe clinical cases, some kind of ongoing recovery support and recovery management. Now, most of that historically has been played by 12-step uh, organizations because they are by far the largest and the oldest that have been around the longest. Um, but now, really since the 1980s, there's been a flurry of new kids on the block, as it were, in terms of mutual help organizations, including uh, Smart Recovery. Um, I think this is really important uh, to have these different entities available. Uh, let me give you an analogy. Um, I came up with this one recently, which I like, um, and it's a fitness center. So the question is, do fitness centers work to keep people fit? And I think the answer most of us would say, well, yeah, of course they work to keep people fit, but you've got to go and you've got to work out regularly, right? You've got to go and do something at the fitness center. You can't just go and stand on the sidelines or you have to go there and work out. Um, but the challenge, of course, is how do you engage people? in some kind of workout exercise. So what fitness centers do is they don't just have one thing, well, some do, um, but most fitness centers these days have what? They have a variety of different machines. They have a weight room, they have a free weight room. They've got all kinds of courts. They've got a swimming pool. They've got all kinds of things to attract and engage people in physical fitness activities to arrive at the same endpoint, which is physical fitness but they know that not everybody wants to go to the weight room. So they provide a number of different things to attract and engage people to achieve that same uh, physical fitness goal. That's a smart move. You could arguably make the same case about mutual help organizations. Do mutual help organizations work to keep people fit for recovery? I would argue, yes, we've got good evidence that they do work to help people fit for recovery. Um, if you go, attend regularly and you work out, you work the program that's prescribed in that mutual health organization. Again, the perennial challenge is how do you attract and engage people in mutual health organizations to get people fit for recovery? If I can draw this analogy, typically, historically, what we've done is said that everybody has to go to AA or 12 step because that's kind of the, you know, that's the way to go. Um, and not everybody wants to work out in the weight room. Um, and so we need to provide an array of different kinds of, of, of recovery mutual aid options so that people can that will attract and engage different folks uh, into uh, recovery so they can get fit for recovery. In other words, the same developmental outcome, but in a way that can attract and engage more people. Now, 12 Step has been successful at attracting and engaging some people, but not everybody. So we need a broader array. And of course, this is where um, uh, smart recovery and groups like Smart, New Kids on the Block, have been really important here in providing this different variety of options to get people attracted and engaged and fit 
for recovery, as it were. Now, uh, we have a strong, very strong evidence base now um, produced by, you know, uh, from the research over the last 30 years. It started back in 1990 after the Institute of Medicine called for more research, specifically on Alcoholics Anonymous and treatments designed to link patients with Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's been a flurry of clinical trials and cost effectiveness studies and mechanisms research that's been done, particularly over the last 30 years, which we summarized in this Cochrane uh, review, which is considered to be the gold standard in um, science, uh, clinical science in terms of summarizing evidence. It's a very rigorous protocol you have to go through to produce one of these reviews. And what we found here in this review that AA for severe alcohol use disorder works very well. When patients, when clinicians link patients at random, when they're linked at random and compared to other kinds of interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy, they do as well or better when it comes to abstinence and continuous remission on every single outcome, except remission and abstinence where it does better. It also uh, produces better cost effectiveness. So it's more cost effective. It reduces um, uh, uh, expensive healthcare services by keeping people in remission. And also uh, it substitutes, it looks like it substitutes for other kinds of more professional counseling, which of course is paid for. So these free ubiquitous indigenous recovery support services, in this case AA, can uh, provide ongoing support for people with severe addiction problems in the communities in which they live for free over the long term. This is a public health uh, uh, freebie. You know, I always refer to this as, as the closest thing public health has to a free lunch. Uh, we're lucky that we've got AA and now increasingly other kinds of uh, resources in the community. How does AA do it? What have, we, what have we learned about this particular mutual health group, AA, in terms of how it confers benefit over time? Well, turns out using sophisticated mechanism studies, um, we find that AA mobilizes these therapeutic mechanisms, others too, but these are the ones that have been empirically supported. And it, in other words, it, AA works by helping people shift their social network and thereby increase to, to people who have that lived experience of how to stay sober and in recovery. And it does this by mobilizing coping skills, cognitive behavioral coping skills, abstinence self-efficacy, it reduces impulsivity, it reduces craving, um, it increases spirituality, which can be a way for people to make meaning out of stress, for example. Now, I would argue that these same mechanisms are mobilized not just by AA, because these are not specific to AA, with, with, with perhaps the exception of spirituality, but rather would be mobilized by other groups of people with lived experience who are living lives in recovery, including, I would argue, smart recovery when we get to do those studies. Now, I think the advantage here of these community-based mutual aid organizations like smart recovery, like AA, like others, is that they provide this indigenous ubiquitous recovery support that's accessible that's flexible and that's freely available over the long term. Now, why is that important? When we talk about an illness which is susceptible to relapse over the long term, in severe cases, I'm talking about clinical cases here of addiction or severe uh, alcohol or other drug use disorder, it's highlighted here in this timeline. If you look in the middle there, you can see it takes on average in adult clinical samples, roughly eight years after people start seeking help for an alcohol or other drug use disorder to achieve that first year of full sustained remission and about four to five treatment episodes. So that's quite a long time. What's also noteworthy, if you look on the right-hand side, that even after people achieve that first year of full sustained remission, which is a big achievement in and of itself, uh, it takes another five years, roughly, roughly five years in these adult clinical samples before the risk of meeting criteria for substance use disorder in the next year drops below 15%. Why is 15% important? Because 15% is roughly the annual risk of meeting criteria for an alcohol or other drug use disorder in the general population each year. So to be no more likely than anybody else in the general population of meeting criteria for an alcohol or drug use disorder in the following year, if you've already had it, takes roughly four to five years of continuous remission. So risk remains elevated for that initial five-year period, even after people achieve that first year of full sustained remission. So this suggests that people often need some kind of ongoing 
recovery management and recovery monitoring uh, uh, service. And this is where I think mutual health groups can play a very valuable role. We've seen a growth in these entities over the last 40 years, uh, as I mentioned, 50 years. Um, notably, uh, uh, Smart Recovery, others have come along like Refuge, uh, Life Rain, Women for Sobriety, which is obviously focused mostly on women, Celebrate Recovery, which is a religious, uh, religiously focused one, which has grown a lot uh, over the last 25 years. Uh, we've seen this in, these are data from our national recovery study. We see this growth in alternatives. I can see it's slow growth across the bottom in these um, uh, secular and religious groups, uh, mutual help alternatives to AA, as AA uh, groups uh, attendance have, got, have, gone, have gone down, relatively speaking, uh, across time and others have grown. So we're getting, if you take that, that uh, fitness center analogy, we're getting more uh, kind of um, uh, fitness um, options for people to get fit for recovery. And that's, I think, good news. There is an emerging evidence base. You know, Alison um, did a fantastic job uh, creating that uh, systematic review. And we've got more and more studies coming out on alternatives, including SMART. Uh, Sarah Zemore did this nice study, uh, which looked at people self-selecting into different recovery groups, including SMART, Women for Sobriety, AA, and Life Ring. Uh, and found similar outcomes for people who self-selected into these groups uh, when you accounted for their goal, what they wanted to achieve as part of their recovery goal. So I think that's encouraging that, again, it's not so much about relative efficacy per se, as it is finding something that you can work out with. It's finding a machine, finding a, 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 an activity, in this case, a, a mutual support group that fits for your particular style of recovery. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about today is some results from um, our um, uh, ongoing study, um, prospective study of different groups of individuals who are selecting into different recovery support options, including smart recovery. We have 368 people. They were recruited from the metro Boston area in New England, as well as uh, the Southwest in, in, um, in San Diego. Um, everybody, this is a focus on alcohol use disorder, um, and they were mostly severe alcohol use disorder, but people who were uh, in SMART recovery, we recruited them from SMART, but they were starting a new recovery attempt. So everybody in this study was starting off as a, in a new recovery attempt, self-defined new recovery attempt. They were starting to, you know, uh, uh, to change again and, and to look to ways to help themselves uh, get into recovery. And as you can see at the bottom here, there were four distinct uh, groups. There were people who were um, in smart recovery when they started their um, new recovery attempt. There were people in AA. There were people who both went to smart and AA. And there was a neither smart nor AA group. Okay, so they were kind of, they didn't go to either smart or AA. They may have attended other kinds of things, but they didn't uh, go to any mutual health groups. Uh, these are the measures. So we looked at uh, demographics, alcohol use disorder, severity indicators, and alcohol use, functioning, quality of life and well-being, recovery resources and barriers, and treatment history. So what did we find? So these were the groups in terms of the uh, the ends. Uh, the neither group was the biggest. Um, uh, these were the folks who didn't choose either AA or SMART, uh, but were starting a new recovery attempt. So a lot, there was a larger group there. And we had about 60 to 70 people in each of the other groups. So we had 63 in the SMART group, um, 72 in the AA group, and then 50 people who were, went to SMART and AA when they started their new recovery attempt. So within the last 90 days, they'd attended one, at least one of these different uh, meetings or both in the case of SMART and AA. And so what did we find across these different indices of demographics, um, substance use histories, treatment histories, uh, and other, other variables, quality of life and well-being. Well, in terms of um, the, the uh, sex breakdown of participation, it was, no, it was non-significantly different. You can see it's roughly the same, about half um, were attending slightly more in the um, neither group were women. Uh, in terms of age, there were, this was not significant. It looks like in the smart group, they were slightly older, um, but it didn't reach statistical significance. In other words, there was a lot of variability in age across these different uh, groups. In terms of sexual orientation, again, it looks like it might be different here for SMART on the left, 
Um, but it was about equal, and you account for the variability in terms of sexual minorities attending these different groups, about a quarter roughly. Um, in terms of Hispanic ethnicity, again, this was actually non-significant. It uh, looks like it might be, um, but um, it might be a power issue here. But you can see what's interesting descriptively is that the AA group here had fewer um, uh, Hispanic individuals. They were all pretty low, of course, but SMART had the most here in terms of uh, engaging uh, Hispanic uh, ethnicity individuals, although it was non-significant. Where there was a significant difference in terms of race um, was that SMART recovery was more likely to be white. Um, it did not have any black participants at all um, uh, or Asian participants or Alaskan, uh, uh, American Indian and Alaskan natives. Uh, it did have some multiracial, uh, but uh, for some reason, not, there was no, no black individuals or Asian or uh, American Indian, uh, Alaskan natives in, in SMART recovery there was um, about 20% were uh, in the AA group were black and uh, smart and AA as well as neither. In terms of education, um, the smart group again was different. Um, it was more educated. So um, uh, substantially more roughly twice as many people compared to AA had a BA or higher. Um, and um, income was similar in terms of higher income in the smart group relative to the AA group and the SMART and AA uh, and, uh, and neither group. So higher education, higher income. They were also more likely in the SMART group to be uh, married or living as married compared to uh, the uh, AA and AA plus plus SMART uh, group, but were similar to the neither group. And in terms of alcohol use disorder severity, um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, as you can see, severe disorder across all three groups, smart AA and smart plus AA, uh, where you saw the big difference was in the neither group, as you might imagine, people who did not seek any kind of external help tended to have less severe um, uh, substance alcohol use disorder. Um, and the smart group had marginally more moderate uh, uh, substance use disorder compared to um, the smart uh, plus AA and the AA uh, only group. In terms of consequences, again, uh, smart recovery had significantly fewer um, alcohol and other drug consequences compared to the AA only and the smart plus AA group. And the alcohol use goals were broadly similar with a, uh, a slight uh, difference between uh, the, the, um, uh, the smart group was more likely to choose an a, non a moderation goal. Um, and um, uh, you can see that on the right hand side is where it differs the most in terms of the neither group who are more interested in having a having relatively speaking of having a goal of control controlled use. Um, and then lifetime use of alcohol use disorder and mental health meds were roughly the same apart from the neither group, as you can see here on the right, they were the ones that used those less, as you might guess. And in terms of uh, prior hospitalizations and inpatient and outpatient treatment utilization, again, the SMART recovery uh, group was different, had less utilization of these um, uh, uh, outpatient, inpatient, uh, and detox residential uh, services. Um, similar story with other lifetime recovery support service use, uh, generally speaking, um, uh, SMART was different, particularly uh, on things like recovery high school, school use and um, uh, uh, less likely to use uh, recovery, collegiate recovery compared to the SMART plus AA, um, as well as recovery community centers. Uh, less criminal justice involvement also for the SMART group, less likely to be, uh, again, commit to uh, sobriety, um, Slightly less, although it was still high, it was high across all these groups that were seeking help. So in summary, um, and I've gone through those quite quickly, um, but I think I can summarize the general picture, what we're seeing here at, again, this is a baseline uh, when people are coming into the study and they've self-selected into one of these four different groups. Uh, we've learned generally speaking that compared to individuals who self-select into either nothing, no external service use, or um, AA or SMART plus AA. 
people who are choosing smart tend to be more likely to be, to be white, have high income, more education, more likely to be in a marital relationship or living with someone as if they're married, have lower consequences related to the alcohol use, are less likely to have utilized um, inpatient or outpatient services or detox, uh, less likely to have used certain recovery support services, particularly recovery community centers, but have similar rates of medication use, both for alcohol and other psychotropic meds for other psychiatric conditions, less likely, it's likely to have an abstinence goal, have lower criminal justice involvement, but have similar levels of quality of life functioning and self-esteem. Just a few limitations to keep in mind. Obviously, these are from two areas, New England and um, uh, San Diego areas. Um, they pertain to alcohol use disorder, primary alcohol use disorder, people starting a new recovery attempt. We cannot attest, it doesn't mean anything really yet in this particular analysis about the relative benefit of participation, but we hope to be able to report that soon. Um, as we have, are collecting, finishing up the data collection with the post, but we're following these folks up for two years. So we'll be able to look at um, patterns of involvement, engagement, and also migration across into other groups as they go along in their recovery uh, journey. Um, so look forward to uh, uh, telling you more of the story down the road as we gather the data. Um, but these are uh, what we're finding so far in terms of uh, participant affiliation and the characteristic. So thanks for listening and I'll pass it back to Katie. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, really exciting data and don't go too far away because we've, we've got a few questions uh, for you here. Um, so the, the first one is what are the major reasons uh, in this study or in your prior work why if some people don't engage with, with AA and, and might, you know, I'm gonna just add to this question, might engage in SMART over, over AA? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I think it's finding the right fit, isn't it? I, I think it's, um, you know, some people feel more comfortable, um, don't feel comfortable in AA, and they feel comfortable in SMART. Um, and it may be something about the, the way that SMART recovery groups are run, the way that they're facilitated more by a trained person. Uh, that's more comfortable for certain people. Um, the focus on kind of an evidence-based approach stemming from CBT, again, can be more appealing to certain people, to smaller groups in SMART, that could be more appealing. Um, so there are different, and this is something we can you know, learn more in qualitative research, uh, which we've actually done, a, by the way, we've done another study in, in the context of this study, looking at that exact question, what people like um, and why they go to these different groups. So look forward to telling you that story, but. I think it's just these different, different flavors, isn't it, of, of, of different groups that pe certain people like and they want to self-select into. And that's why it's so important to have these different options available, menu of options that people, just like a fitness center, as I say, that people can be attracted to and engage in and hopefully benefit from. Yeah, I love, I love that analogy. Um, a, a couple of questions I'm going to put together is, is regarding um, field of employment, work history, and also religion and, and spirituality. And, and I believe you covered some of that, but wondering if you, if you want to speak more to um, those differences by the groups. Mm. Yeah, so, so the SMART group was more likely to be employed. Um, I'm not sure if I had that on there or not, but um, they were more likely to be employed. They had higher income. They had kind of generally a more stable um, psychosocial picture compared to the other groups, including the SMART plus AA group, interestingly. Um, but the, um, what was the other bit of employment, uh, Katie? What was the other bit? Um, uh, religiosity. Oh, religious. Yes, religiosity. Now, I can't remember now. I, I don't think that was significant. And that's why I didn't put, I didn't put everything up. We got a lot of variables. Um, but that was not, not significant. Um, we do have a dimensional scale of spirituality and kind of spiritual practices. Um, and I can't remember actually, forgive me um, um, uh, exactly what came out there, but I think if it was significant, I would have put it up here. But um, I, I remember one thing that was interesting was that the spirituality in the SMART group was actually quite high, um, which kind of surprised me um, uh, somewhat because you know, it was kind of a secular alternative to, to 12 step and other religious, more religious groups. Um, the people were quite spiritual who were attending a, a smart recovery as well. 
Okay, and then, back to uh, one, one more question for you, and then I'm going to save one of these for the end, but uh, one more question around whether the study included individuals who were mandated by the court or other authority. No, so these were all voluntary. Okay. Great. Yep. Um, these last two questions I'm actually going to save for, for a more general discussion. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for your fabulous presentation. I yep. now have the pleasure of, of introducing Dr. Tom Horvath, who is a clinical psychologist who has specialized in addictive problems since 1985. And he's one of the co-founders of SMART and was president of SMART for 20 years. And he'll be speaking about future directions for SMART recovery research. And some of your questions we'll be, we'll be tackling uh, in, in that discussion. So take it away, Dr. Horvath. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> this presentation is organized around questions. I hope that these questions will be meaningful, not only to the scientists, but the other audiences participating today. In some cases, I may have questions on the slide that may not, um, uh, have time for coverage in the discussion. And the first question is a theoretical one. It follows on from what we've been hearing, uh, concerns SMART's unique contribution, if any, to mutual health. And I wanna consider that question in the context of um, three items. One is what appears to be emerging as the equivalent effect of mutual help groups. Now, this is both a question and a summary of findings. And uh, fortunately, we have the study that Dr. Kelly just described and the uh, PAL-2 study, the follow-up on PAL-1 by Sarah Zemore. So we're going to have some more data. We might actually somewhat firmly be able to say in two or three years that mutual help groups are, generally speaking, equivalently effective. This is a conclusion that doesn't seem to have disturbed anybody in smart recovery too much, but uh, the next context might. And this is some work done by Reddy and colleagues uh, in the UK recently that suggested that across 30 different mutual health groups, the underlying activities were essentially the same improving self-confidence, improving coping skills, et cetera, rather than there being uh, separate mechanisms of action in each group. And I wanna compare this uh, to what we've been finding about CBT. SMART is often equated with CBT. The American Psychological Association a year ago released the Handbook of Cognitive Behavior Therapy this is a two volume work, 1600 pages over 50 chapters. If there are true believers in CBT, they can be found among the authors of these chapters. One chapter concludes uh, CBT mechanisms of change have not been clearly elucidated. And another chapter states uh, regarding psychotherapy in general, there is little empirical evidence for the notion that different processes are at work in treatments associated with different theoretical frameworks. So in psychotherapy, we appear to be concluding that psychotherapies are roughly speaking, equally equivalent and any component of them, we could not say was evidence-based, it's the package that is evidence-based. So coming back to SMART and CBT, we couldn't apparently say that this tool from CBT or this tool in SMART is an evidence-based tool. It is simply part of an evidence-based package. And this led me once to say that it's not the tools that are working, um, which got uh, restated, but not quite accurately that the tools don't work. Uh, as we'll come back to them, the tools are very important to individuals <clears throat> in our groups. Uh, how they work exactly remains uh, not entirely clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I wanna add this third piece and Dr. Kelly was just talking about this. Uh, if he didn't say this directly, he nearly did. AA and 
12 step facilitation interventions performed at least as well as established active comparison treatments, that is CPT. And with this comparison, I'm drawing the connection to the common factors of psychotherapy. I've listed them there. What appears to be necessary across all forms of psychotherapy is that the client, and this is individual therapy, the client and the therapist need to agree on what the goals are. They need to have established a game plan and a, uh, a connection with one another and alliance for moving forward. The client needs to feel understood, that's empathy, uh, and respected, and the client needs to believe that the therapist is behaving in a genuine manner. That's in individual therapy, but presumably this also applies to groups and presumably, and, and it does, although the additional component of group cohesion is a factor. And it may also apply across uh, all of treatment and mutual help. What kind of um, underlying factors might account for all this? And a related question about the ceiling of effectiveness, because <clears throat> I didn't place it here, but the apparently the effectiveness of psychotherapy over the last 40 some years has not increased. And we may also have hit the ceiling for the effectiveness of uh, mutual help. So this is the analogy that follows up on the fitness center analogy. If you go to the fitness center, this shows you what you might be doing afterwards. And I imagine that at one point in the past, individuals might have argued that Italian or Chinese or Mexican food is the most healthful food. And who knows on what basis they would have made that argument. But once we discovered nutrition and discovered macronutrients and water soluble and fat soluble vitamins and macro minerals and trace minerals, when we understood that, we could start to define what made a food nutritious. And if we look at fast food, we could also define what uh, should be in food in minimal amounts or perhaps not at all. So in light of this food analogy, if SMART is not more effective and if SMART is not substantially different, what is SMART's unique contribution, if any, to mutual health? Are we simply a different flavor? I noticed that Dr. Kelly actually used that term flavor and he is starting to answer this question to whom does SMART appeal? Uh, this analogy, unfortunately, may not work as well in the UK because I understand that food there is not as flavorful, but uh, perhaps it, it will work around the rest of the world. And there's a sample SMART meeting with, with Dr. Gerstein uh, at the podium there. So SMART will not get a chance to make its unique contribution if it doesn't survive. So I now have a set of questions that I'm terming practical because these require good answers if we are to move forward. Our biggest problem is lack of meetings. And then we are connected to the question of training, how much of training is in nutrition and how much training is in cuisine. I think a related question is what is a minimally sufficient or effective meeting? What's noteworthy about all these um, studies of smart recovery uh, that we've been looking at uh, that Dr. Beck presented is that the meetings are a kind of black box. We don't exactly know what happens in them. And I think one thing we can be certain of is that these meetings are not consistently conducted. There's not a firm protocol. We're dealing with uh, volunteers in almost all cases. So uh, scientifically, that's one issue that might need to be evaluated over time. But let me go back to the top of this slide. How do you think of a meeting? Is it primarily group therapy and the therapist, uh, the, the facilitator is a junior therapist? This is a seminar where the uh, facilitator is a master teacher who doesn't lecture much, but asks 
skillful questions and guides the discussion? Is it simply a lecture in which individuals are presented a curriculum information that they are to learn by the facilitator, perhaps via a set presentation? Or an option I don't hear discussed much, but uh, which I have proposed from time to time, is it a kind of networking event? So I invite your attention to the concept of networking event for a moment. To throw a successful networking event, you simply need to establish a time and place, identify who is invited, what kind of person. Let's say we're going to do um, a networking event for computer software salespeople. And that word goes out and the networking event is relatively simple. Perhaps you invite people to share their names, their job title and the company they're with. And then the host somewhat disappears and assumes that the participants will take charge of learning what they need to learn from one another of course, this is not a group discussion. This is multiple um, smaller discussions, but I'm suggesting, and this I think could be tested, that in fact, in meetings, this is a lot of what's going on as people listen to one another and the significance of this meeting, if it could be shown to be effective, is that the training for it would be much simpler. And it raises the question then, are the more sophisticated meetings that SMART operates um, worth the effort that it takes to provide them? So coming back to this issue of how SMART facilitators should be trained, we could be asking questions about the prerequisites, who makes a good facilitator based on their history, if they were just learning meeting management, what would be necessary to do that? Rather than trying to recruit people who are high in empathy, could, which might require some significant effort, or training them in empathy, which might also require some significant effort, could we create something that I'm terming empathy light, which would involve uh, a focus on thanking people for their contributions, their shares, acknowledging some of the key points of what they have said, something like, gee, that sounds like it was tough. Um, I appreciate your sharing that with us. Thank you for being here. Would that be sufficient and would it be easily trainable? So from this perspective, the classic tools of smart recovery, at least in the US, cost benefit analysis and so forth could or I would say should be considered as prompts to discussion and sharing rather than evidence-based tools which people must learn in order to be successful in smart recovery. Also, a proper networking event has certain rules. They're not hard to follow. Smart's rules are a little more complex, but I think, uh, well, I have attempted to capture here what I consider to be the essential ones. Uh, participation not being required relaxes people, confidential and free, of course, a conversational meeting so no one dominates. We don't tell people what to do, and that includes allowing them to be free to use their own language. So if they want to call themselves an addict or an alcoholic, we should allow that. Uh, but we do stay on the general topic of focusing on addictive problems and even more importantly, building a better life. Uh, there's been some uh, controversy, not around the world, but in the US on whether we're focused on abstinence maintenance or uh, achieving abstinence or just making progress. I'll let that go for the moment. And uh, the notion of actively engaging in SMART rather than talking about it um over time in the operation of smart meetings i estimated the other day I, since the pandemic began i have conducted now about 400 meetings so i'm feeling quite well versed in what happens uh in meetings these days and these seem to be the kinds of rules um, that someone could enforce relatively simply with relatively less training uh, and 
would produce a minimally sufficient meeting. Now, in addition to training, we also need to pay some attention to recruitment and retention because uh, without that, we won't have the size of organization that we need. And there are many questions around how to do this, which I think the organization uh, and the scientists have not actually begun to consider. It, for me, suggests that if we're going to develop a culture of donating, which the organization wants to do to have revenue stream, we could also establish a culture of volunteering and mentoring. But how do we do that? And how do we diversify the people who do volunteer? I want to remind you of an organization called Recovery International. This was founded in 1937. You might not have heard of it. I'm quoting from their homepage. Recovery International offers a cognitive behavioral training method which has helped people learn to identify and manage negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and behaviors, beliefs, and behaviors that can lead to emotional distress and related physical symptoms. And from their Wikipedia page, based on self-control, self-confidence, and increasing one's determination to act. Now, even though AA had a head start on them by two years, Recovery International was founded in 1937. Um, that two-year difference won't account for the fact that AA has over 100,000 meetings worldwide and Recovery International, as nearly as I can tell, has only a few hundred. I'm confident that SMART will survive, but will it thrive? We have here a comparison organization with what looks to me to be a very similar approach but I would say is not thriving as much as it might. So this practical question about how we grow SMART is also um, needing to focus on SMART's impact in the community because a community will support an organization that it perceives as valuable. And there are many potential impacts of SMART in the community. Uh, towards the bottom of this slide, I'm focusing on, as noted, uh, the lack of diversity in SMART. And one of my hypotheses is that to the extent that SMART presents itself as a program rather than a meeting, uh, we could be perceived um, as a group of white, educated, well-off individuals who are imposing their approach to recovery and change upon this group that's already been imposed upon enough by them. Uh, a meeting could help pull for strengths. A program can suggest deficits. And I have heard many times from people who've attended their first cognitive therapy for depression and they come out and say, oh my God, not only am I depressed, I don't even think right. And I think somebody could come out of a smart reading possibly with that perspective, which would be problematic. So let's come back to this notion of program. As some of you know, I have argued against the idea of SMART as a program for a long time and proposed that instead it's a community of meetings. But in my requests of those who do view it as a program uh, to tell me succinctly uh, what is the program, from what I have heard, I think the essence of the program is that you can think about your thinking. Whatever thought or impulse enters your mind does not necessarily mean that you need to act on it. Um, this is an idea from Stoicism, roughly 2,300 years old. It's considered a foundation of CBT that we um, can stand back and evaluate. But the biggest evaluation that most of our participants probably need to do is to consider their behavior in the context of relationships. To remind you, most substance problems begin in the teen years, um, the serious ones, not all of them. And that developmental process to young adulthood might well be disrupted. The evaluation that someone needs to do to decide that it's not worth acting on this um, uh, substance urge is to consider not only the relationships they're in, but their own future self. So myself today might enjoy drinking, but myself in 
five years, 10 years or longer, probably does not want to get cirrhosis. Progress for these folks includes improved relationships. And we say this, the opposite of addiction is connection. But the distinction that's important is that it's not change for others. Clinicians can tell you that when you change for someone else, your motivation will be short-lived. I'm not changing uh, for my partner. I am changing to be a better partner. So in light of looking for underlying factors, the nutrition behind the cuisine, what I've just described is um, from developmental psychology, Robert Keegan, who's also at, or was at Harvard, the transition to the socialized mind, which is the transition that should occur in adolescence to young adulthood. It's a focus not just on rights and responsibility, not rights and desires, but also on responsibilities. Now, if you've spent any time with adolescents, you know that they are highly um, responsive about their rights. Why, I'm practically an adult. Why can't I choose to do this myself? They are not so big on responsibility to themselves of their future or their relationships. I also think that this developmental model, which is increasingly used in understanding psychopathology, may explain why the disease model is so enduring because it's a recognition of how difficult it is to change to the um, fully socialized mind. So imagine taking a five-year-old and a 10-year-old to the top of a skyscraper and asking them to look down at the sidewalk and street and say what they see. And the five-year-old says, look at the tiny people. And the 10-year-old says, look how tiny the people look. The five-year-old is captured by its perception and cannot rise above it. The 10-year-old has a concept of people and recognizes that there are no tiny people that he's looking at. Um, but that this is another effect. I've pulled here the definition of craving from the DSM, a strong desire to drink that makes it difficult to think of anything else and that often results in the onset of drinking. The individual in the grip of a craving cannot stand back to observe it like the five-year-old cannot stand back from observing a perception. These are... Uh, changes that are also described by Piaget, Maslow, and others. And I am proposing that uh, one way to look at the underlying changes that are occurring in SMART uh, is that transition. When you talk to people, uh, you get these kinds of answers. If you came across a group of individuals engaging in what's shown in this picture and ask each in turn, what are you doing? The answers you get might be, I'm laying bricks, I'm building a wall, I'm building a building, I am building a community center, I'm contributing to the development of my community, I am contributing to the development of humanity. And the expansiveness range of those answers uh, describes different levels of uh, development. The, uh, well, one upshot of Dr. Kelly's study, and I don't think this was planned, is that, because uh, he don't think he realized it, is that in Massachusetts, uh, SMART tends to be more emphasized as program. In San Diego, it's more emphasized as mutual health community. Uh, possibly this will be a test. The numbers aren't very large. Only a very large difference between outcomes would be significant. But my prediction is that community is not gonna have any worse outcomes. And in fact, it'll be easier uh, to train facilitators. And SMART operating as a community, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these, but uh, we need to pay attention not just to how meetings are conducted, but how the community thrives. And the larger question is really at the bottom, can a non-higher power community thrive? Recovery International has not. Um, what will it take to make this secular community thrive? So starting next week, if you want the slides or the references, please feel free to email me uh, at that address. I conclude, 
that um, we still have much to learn about the black box of mutual help. It will be very helpful to make comparisons to other groups, but also to treatment. We do need to focus on mechanisms of change beyond tools. I hope that there will be some consideration of adult development uh, as a factor in what's happening in all mutual health. And of course, SMART needs to grow substantially. I have some final questions. Will SMART be the science-based and self-transforming approach it promised to be? I wanna thank uh, Dr. Peter Kelly and the Global Research Advisory Committee for uh, hosting this webinar. I do hope it becomes an annual event. And I'm wondering how referrals to SMART will be made in the future. I do sometimes refer to AA and I say, well, if you want to, you can pay attention to the higher power and to the sponsor and to the steps. But really the important thing is that you go and listen to people, make some relationships, compare your story with their stories and learn from people without necessarily, necessarily buying into all of the ideology that goes with it. And the meetings could be very helpful to you. They don't do a belief test at the door, go and gather what you can and build the relationships that you can. Will someone in the future refer to SMART in the same way? You know, you don't need to pay attention to all those tools and all those acronyms, but do listen to the stories, make relationships, um, and uh, consider your problems in the light of the other problems and solutions that you're hearing. Or will there be multiple pathways within smart recovery so that someone who wants to be tool focused can find a home there and someone who wants to focus in another way will also find a home. So. My vision for SMART, the organization, is that we have the scientists on one side of the bridge with the GRAC in particular formulating uh, information, sort of packages to be sent across the bridge uh, that the organization transforms into meaningful messages for facilitators um, to carry the latest scientific knowledge through our facilitators and meetings into the world because uh, we, are in times of increasing addictive problems and the world definitely needs smart recovery. We need to rise to our responsibilities to be the best organization that we can and that will require very solid science to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Horvath. And I have some questions specifically for you, and then um, I'll bring all of our panelists up for uh, some additional questions. Uh, so Dr. Horvath, specifically for you, being an expert in the method is different from being an expert in addictive behaviors. What, what do you think about that? Uh, expert in the method? I think being an expert in, in the smart recovery approach is, is different from being an expert in active, addictive behaviors. I, I have, well, I'm a psychologist, I practice and I see clients. I think that um, it's very important for me to know the kinds of things that happen for individuals who have addictive problems and uh, having listened to thousands of such individuals now, I have a large body of knowledge, but you can get something similar just by going to a mutual health group. I'm less personally focused on method and I'm less concerned about method in meetings. Uh, I've conducted meetings in which we just keep going around the circle and people talk about what comes to them at the moment, which is not unlike an AA meeting actually, uh, where there's virtually no structure. And the meetings, um, my clinical sense of them is that they are quite effective and quite meaningful to participants. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question that's asked, but I'm, I'm more concerned about knowing addictive problems than about methods for dealing with them. And, and I think I, I got some clarification here. So when the participants do not know 12 step or other methods, SMART works very well. It does, it, it does not need to be compared or complemented. Would, would you agree with that? True. There's no reason to make comparisons of, unless somebody's asking for it. Yeah, great, great. Um, and then 
So I'm going to open it up actually for all of the panelists uh, to for our last 15 minutes here together. Um, some really uh, general questions uh, that have come through that I think would be fun to, to discuss as a group. And the first is, is how online meetings uh, have impacted any of what we've talked about today, particularly um, the data that Dr. Beck reported, Dr. Horvath, your experience of leading these meetings. How, how, have, how has COVID impacted SMART uh, and, and in particularly in, in thinking about outcomes and uh, mechanisms? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I might take a punt just to begin with and then feel free for anyone else to jump in. Um, we actually did a little bit of work on this recently um, last year and just in the process of writing it up, um, we spoke to both participants and facilitators who had experience of online groups only, face-to-face -face groups only, or a mixture of face-to-face -face and online. Um, and interestingly enough, I guess one of the key take home messages that I had from speaking to all of these people is that it very much came back to that kind of preference and flavor and choice and finding that thing that kind of works best for you. Um, some people adored online meetings, that it was something that was very convenient to them. Um, and quite enjoyed the fact that they didn't need to have a chat to people before and after because they found that a bit anxiety provoking. Other people really missed that opportunity to be able to actually build those relationships and have those connections. And so I think um, it's perhaps not necessarily a, a question of which one's better, but it's another option for people to be able to, to find a, something that fits best for them. I, there may be some significant differences between people who will refuse to go to Zoom meetings, uh, which is what I saw two years ago when my San Diego meeting network almost collapsed and people were almost enraged. I mean, they didn't even know who to be angry with. Uh, many came back later, some have just not returned. I think they're two slightly different populations, but I don't know how to characterize them. Yeah, that's really interesting. Sorry to jump in again, but just the, um, we had, it sort of had that different flavor as well between people who were attending the face-to-face -face groups and then were kind of forced to transition online versus people who'd only ever had experience of the online groups. Again, it feels like there's a something different there, but I'm not quite sure what that actually is yet. Um, sorry, John. No, 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 not at all. Um, no, I, I, the one thing that comes to mind, actually not from, I mean, anecdotally, I could speak about kind of just impressions about different stories of experiences of online and, and, and in person and, and the outrage and the upset. Uh, when all the you know in-person meetings closed down, but in another study recently, we're doing another study actually looking at AA mechanisms right now. Another big cohort study, interestingly, and it just came up last week actually that in, when we're looking at some of the data, um, that people, you know, everybody was going to mostly online meetings, um, they felt substantially less safe going to online meetings than they did in person. Uh, interestingly, and the RC you know, research coordinators said just from picking up the conversation was that because of all the Zoom bombing and people coming into meetings, um, that they felt less safe there than they do in the regular face-to-face -face meetings, which was, of course, getting that context that, you know, the Zoom, you know, the Zoom bombing can be, can be pretty upsetting. Um, and uh, so that was, that was an interesting little anecdote that came out of, of, of that. Uh, you know, out of that data point where people were feeling less safe, even though they were reporting, you know, a lot of attendance online, but they were feeling less safe online, interestingly. So anyway, yeah. just to throw that out there. Yeah. And speaking to that as well, just around the safety, we had some people, it was um, predominantly in um, sort of rural, regional communities where it was quite small if people didn't have their video cameras on, there was a bit of concern around, you know, is that my mm, sister who sat there or, you know, people on um, domestic violence orders and things like that, or perhaps involved in the child protection system, those sorts of things, the whole camera on, camera off flexibility right. could potentially cause yeah. a little bit of safety yeah. issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely lots of things that need to be considered when it comes to running an online meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Th thank you all. I'm going to move to, um, we're, we're getting a lot more questions now. And so a, a lot of questions about um, uh, types of people who are, who are coming to SMART, um, as well as potential referral to SMART. And so one comment about uh, people with a background of science of some sort being more interested in SMART, um, potentially correctional settings and, and uh, individuals in Australia uh, who are more diverse, less well, well educated, um, and also in, um, in London, uh, a more diverse group of, of patients coming to SMART. And so just wondering any thoughts on that. And, and then related is, is a question around referral bias and, and whether that could explain some discrepancies in demographics, whether, whether certain treatment professionals might type pass when they refer people to specific programs and, and any thoughts about, about any of that, who, who is coming to SMART, who's more interested in SMART as well as kind of professional referrals. And, and more generally, uh, you know, what is being done to inform providers of 12-step of alternatives uh, to, to, you know, alternatives to AA and referring patients to those 12-step alternatives like SMART. So that was a lot, trying to trying to get as many questions as we can in there in our little bit of time here. Well, I, I'll take first stab at this. So um, John showed the cover of Broadening the Base of Treatment for Alcohol Problems, published in 1990. And in many ways, the world has hardly changed since the publication of that book, except for all this research on the effectiveness of AA, which a lot of professionals just didn't want to believe. And the traditional treatment world seems to me largely unchanged, uh, not entirely. And I assume that SMART grows individual by individual as people within the traditional community hear about it, have realized some of their own concerns about the traditional approach. Um, they don't particularly read research. And gradually we make friends and we network. Um, Psychotherapists tend to be very open to SMART. That's what I think is gonna to have to happen. I'd love to see some research on the most effective way to disseminate SMART within a community. And we'd have lots of opportunities to start with a community that has no SMART at all and see what it would take to disseminate there. But of course we need to be able to establish meetings there to do that. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a catch 22, isn't there? Because, you know, Clinicians don't refer to SMART, you know, because there's not that many in the in the or they don't have the evidence base, and they think and there's not that many in the community, and so uh, and yet they don't grow because we don't have the evidence base, you know, we don't we're not doing research on. It. So that's the you know that's what we're trying to change, of course, is to try and establish more evidence, um, and and I think very significantly, and we've got to have different options, um, got to have different, you know parts of the fitness center for recovery uh, that are going to attract and engage people. I think that that's key. Um, not everybody's going to want to go to SMART. Some people are. Some people are going to go to, to AA for different reasons. Some people go to both because, and this is an interesting group. Um, and we've interviewed now 60 people who go to both. So we're going to have those data soon in terms of what they uh, you know, what, why they go to bunk, why do, what do they get out of SMART and what do they get out of AIDS? That's an interesting group, isn't it? Um, so we're going to learn more uh, about that. And um, I think, uh, you know, I remember being in the room at RSA, I don't know when it was, maybe 1997, it was when, the, 1998 maybe, when Dick Longabau was sharing the result, three-year outcome results of uh, 12 of Project MAT, which favored 12-step. And there were some psychologists in the room that were saying, well, it's not fair because 12 step has AA, right? And I was like, well, isn't that the point? You know, but, but imagine this, right? Imagine if CBT had smart recovery. You know, imagine if we were doing, a, doing our CBT and then referring patients systematically incorporating the smart and, you know, getting them, the, putting the idea just like with 12 step facilitation, but with smart facilitation. Um, because if you can get people um, going to SMART during CBT and treatment, just like 12-step, 
I think we'd see you know, similar outcomes um, to the, and, and people would, would self-select, you know, they'd be facilitated. And we know that we can amplify participation by clinically talking about it. Um, I think we could do the same thing with SMART, with CBT and SMART. That'd be a great study, wouldn't it? We've actually got one plan to do that, so. <laughs> well, if we could extend your Cochrane review finding, we might conclude that SMART was effect as effective as CBT. And uh, the challenge is just to get people to go. And I confess, I have not solved that challenge. One of the great ironies of my life is that well under 10% of my clients attend smart recovery. They mm -hmm. can afford individual sessions and that's what they want. And they don't wanna be bothered by other people's problems in groups. And I try to persuade them that there's, they're missing something there, but um, I have not been particularly effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you have more questions there, Katie. Uh, I could, I could, you know, we could go off on other things here, but maybe there's more specific questions to answer. There, there's many um, that we won't get to all of them, but but I do think one, you know, the next one, I, I do want to make sure we just hit if we can of of how do, how do the findings and the kind of next steps inform future engagement with with individuals who identify as black indigenous persons of colors as well as other marginalized communities how how do we increase the engagement in smart of these groups and and meet people where they're at to to help them engage in in smart well i would say we need to do more um outreach to the black community and other minoritized groups period we found this in all kinds of recovery support services and opportunities that they're just not applying for. You know, and you know, we, we, you know, I was speaking to the state of Massachusetts, for example, uh, and they, they were the state was complaining to me, saying, "Well, we're putting out all these things for uh, my, minority communities; they're not applying for them." And then they realized that they had to go out and meet them and, and get to know them and build trust. Uh, and I think probably. And Tom, you can speak to this better than me. Um, but you know, we, we need to do more of that with SMART too, you know, kind of go into those communities and meet them. And I think in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken, Joe Erstein was telling me they've got groups in Chicago which are attended, populated by many more black individuals. So it may just be a function of kind of where it's at and who's running the groups and you know how they how they reach out, et cetera. So we had the funding to place community centers in neighborhoods as above and beyond in Chicago has done. It's the pioneer in this area. Uh, we, and, I, and I've attended it a few times and you, you see uh, black, lower socioeconomic, homeless in some cases, relatively un uneducated individuals who engage in um, amazingly interesting smart recovery discussions. So it, there's nothing about what we do that won't work for, I think, a wide range of populations, but they have to be introduced to it. Yeah, and I think that idea of the sort of co-design and collaboration is really important as well, that it's not a, something that we're kind of enforcing on people, that it's a, something that we're sort of coming alongside with. Um, one of our colleagues, Elizabeth Dale, did, she did some work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and working alongside them to understand whether or not the way that the format of smart recovery, does that actually fit with the kind of traditional Aboriginal yarn um, and being able to adapt to incorporate those cultural principles and being able to adapt the manual to make it more culturally sensitive just to kind of have that um, coming alongside you rather than enforcing us something on you um, I think those kind of things you know as um, John and Tom were saying about actually going into the community to get that sense of what's needed is really important wonderful so we are we are at time thank you so much Ali Tom John and the global research advisory committee and of course smart recovery smart recovery international and thanks to all of you for hanging in there. Sorry, we did not get to all of your questions, but uh, even more motivation to keep doing these webinars annually uh, and, and get to come together uh, across continents to, to talk about SMART and the, the research coming out of SMART. So thank you all, great job. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, take care. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> thanks for facilitating. Good to see thank everybody. You. Thanks everybody. Of course, thank you. Thanks.
Want to have a lot of fun, get fit, and help support a really meaningful cause this April? Join the 30-day Take On Addiction Fundraising Challenge. Just sign up to walk, run, cycle, or choose your own activity to raise money for Smart Recovery, a global leader in mutual support services that empowers people everywhere to take back control of their lives and gain total freedom from their addictions. Sign up is quick and easy. Create your monthly fundraising challenge, invite your friends, form teams, share your results, celebrate your accomplishments, and get in the best shape of your life, knowing you're helping Smart Recovery smash the stigma of addiction and heal individuals and their communities everywhere. What are you waiting for? Just go to takeonaddiction.org and start helping people everywhere lead life beyond addiction today.